This is my 2006 Range Rover. As you know, I review a lot of cars, but this has been my personal car for the last five years and 60,000 miles. Today, I'm going to review it so that I can roll out my brand new car review rating system, the Doug Score. That's right, the Doug score. Now I've spent a lot of time devising this and here's how this is gonna go. I'm gonna keep reviewing cars the exact same way I always do. First I'm gonna show you all the weird quirks and the cool features and then I'm gonna drive them. But after that, I'm gonna rate each car I review on a scale with 10 categories and then I'm gonna give it a total score, the Doug score. Now, I'm gonna go through the Doug score at the end of this video and at the end of most future videos, but if you wanna see it explained in depth, click the link below to go to my website where I've written a long description of all the categories and how they'll be scored. I've decided to start the Doug score with a little practice run my Range Rover. So today I'm going to show you all of its quirks and features and then I'm going to get behind the wheel as I have for the last five years and 60,000 miles and I'm going to tell you what it's like to drive. And then at the end of the video I'm going to give it my very first Doug score. I'm also making this video because my famous Range Rover CarMax warranty ends in less than 8,000 miles, which means it'll probably be up by the end of the year. And that means that I've already started the search for a new personal car. So this video is also kind of a send off for my Range Rover. Now, one interesting quirk about this car is the audio situation. This car is too new to have a tape player, which I would kill for because then I could do some sort of Bluetooth adapter, and yet it's too old to have a USB port or an aux input. As a result, there's only two ways you can listen to the music that you want to hear. There's CDs, which nobody really has anymore, or there's what I do, an FM transmitter. I Bluetooth my phone to the FM transmitter, and then it plays through the radio. I bet you didn't know anybody still made those, but they do because I buy them all the time because they work about as well as you'd expect them to. Take a listen. Yeah. Another one of the bizarre traits about this car is the tailgate unlatching button. This is one of my favorites. Here's the situation. You press the tailgate unlatching button down here and it unlatches the tailgate. No problem, except it unlatches with such tiny little precision that simply closing a door is enough force on the outside of the car to re-latch the tailgate. So, if you unlatch the tailgate, then you get out, shut your door, and walk around to the back, like you're going into your house after you've driven the car, the tailgate will be closed again, I swear, as I shall now demonstrate. Okay, take a look. I'm going to unlatch the tailgate. Unlatch. Now I'm going to shut my door as if I'm going into my house after I went grocery shopping. I think you'll agree that's a normal amount of force to shut a door, right? Now I go back to the tailgate, which I just unlatched, and... <laughs> Hello, so I go back up to my door, unlatch the tailgate, shut the door. <laughs> okay, one more time, I go up to the door, unlatch the tailgate. Eh, carefully, see that? And now the tailgate opens. Very useful. Now, speaking of this tailgate back here, well, one of my favorite things about this car has always been this cool split tailgate that you can put down so that you can have a picnic on the back of the car if you want. It's a really cool idea. And one of my favorite things about this part is this button right here. There's a little button to open the tailgate, except it's this weird rubber button and it's always falling out. It happens all the time. When you remove it, you'll find that on top of the rubber button that shows the tailgate opening, there is a smaller button inside that shows the tailgate opening, presumably because Land Rover knew the button was going to fall out. <laughs> Another thing about this car that people are always asking me about is the armrest. Why does your armrest have a little screw top on it? And that is an excellent question, but believe it or not, it is functional. So basically the way this works is you can adjust where you want the armrest to go. And then to lock it in place, you move the screw top thing. Now this armrest can't go below here. Move it this way, it goes all the way down here. Move it more, it goes even further down. But if I want to really lock it in place up here, now this is as high as it can go. It has some function, even though it's a bit of a strange design. Next, I want to talk about the steering wheel, and specifically two of my favorite buttons on the steering wheel. On the left side, you have a button marked zero or one. That button turns on or off cruise control. Would you like zero cruise control or one cruise control? 
On the right, there is a button called R slash T. I assume this means retweet. I have never used this button in five years and 60,000 miles driving this car. In fact, I have no idea what this button does. R slash T. Nothing. Speaking of weird things around the steering wheel, I divert your attention to my steering wheel stocks. You'll notice that the stock on the left doesn't match the design, the size of the stock on the right. There's a reason for that. On the right is the regular Range Rover stock, but I always really liked how BMW turn signal stocks feel in your hand. This is how weird I am. So, because this car shared its steering column with the BMW X5, I had them switch out the Land Rover steering column turn signal stock for the BMW one. And for the last 40,000 miles, I've been driving around feeling the turn signal stock exactly as I wish to feel it. You're gonna unsubscribe now, aren't you? Next up, let's talk about something about this car that I really like. That would be the rear wiper. You can see it doing its duty, wiping the rear. The thing that I like about this particular rear wiper is that when it's done wiping, it just goes back up and hides under the rear spoiler. You might not think this is a big deal, but it has two benefits. One is that most rear wipers just sit there like this, just dangling there, looking really ugly and stupid. But there's also a functional benefit beyond the style, and that is once it's finished wiping, it hides back up under the spoiler out of your way so that you have a better view at the back. That is smart design. Not such good design is right here. That would be the window switches. Now the window switches in this car are located right next to the window, which initially sounds like it makes some sense. Put the window switches next to the window. It's intuitive, except for one little problem. If you're driving around with the window switches here, even the slightest bit of rain, and you want to drop the window even the slightest inch, moisture will come through the window onto the window switches and it will presumably destroy them. This is terrible design. They've done this on the new Range Rover 2. I don't know why. The result is you cannot put the window down even the slightest bit. It starts to get humid inside the car with a rainstorm. You can't do it because otherwise water comes in and it gets on the window switches. You say you're thinking, all right, we'll put down a back window. No, same problem. We'll put down the passenger window. No, same problem. You just have to sit there with the windows up. Deal with it. Another rather unfortunate quirk of this car is the infotainment system, which is ancient. Now, if you're driving a car even older than this, you're going to say that I'm spoiled. If you're driving a car newer than this, you're going to look at this thing and say, how is it possible that you live with this thing? Well, here is a little bit of a demonstration about using the infotainment system. As you watch this demonstration, you'll notice that the resolution of the screen is terrible. It's incredibly slow to react to any push of any on-screen button. And most importantly, it ain't exactly pinched to zoom, as you'll see. So those are all the weird quirks and the cool features of my Range Rover. Now you see what I've been living with for the last five years and 60,000 miles. And speaking of features, a little update about the Range Rover's famous CarMax warranty. Now, as you probably remember, I paid $3,899 for my Range Rover's warranty five years ago. And as of the last update, it had paid out $15,679.51 in repairs. But then the car broke as I was filming the last video. The steering got stuck and I couldn't really turn. So I hobbled it over to the dealer and CarMax paid out again. This time it was for the steering shaft and they paid $1,214.41, bringing my entire warranty total up to $16,873.92. Remember, I paid $3,899 for this warranty five years ago. With that update out of the way, time to drive this thing. All right, time to comment on the Range Rover driving experience. I've been driving this car for five years, 60,000 miles. So this isn't one of those where I'm like, whoa, it drives like that? I know how it drives. Still feels reasonably luxurious even after all this time. The ride quality is still pretty good, but I have noticed in test driving some Range Rover replacements that the ride quality of this car, ride quality has been improved over the years. It's a little louder than some of the modern luxury SUVs, uh, a little bit more tire noise, road noise. Acceleration is quite mediocre. That's one of the things that I really want to change for my next uh, car. Acceleration in this thing is just very disappointing. I do love the driving position in this car. This is why people buy SUVs, you're sort of up higher, and this you, you have that king of the road sitting on your throne type of driving position. The quality of the materials in this car is still pretty good. I'm still impressed with most of the stuff. It's held up well, which is surprising. 
uh, and it still feels pretty nice in most respects. One of the things I'm most disappointed about with this car is the way that it handles. This thing, you turn and it's like lumbers around and I'm just, I'm really done with that. I'm ready for something that doesn't drive like that. This car still feels quiet and, and restrained and luxurious all this time later. Uh, part of the reason for that is I've done obviously an incredible job of maintaining it because I've had this warranty. Uh, and I've been able to repair every single thing that's ever broken. So while some people would leave some stuff untouched, uh, I've made sure to fix everything the moment it breaks. So this is probably one of the nicer mechanical examples, even though cosmetically it could use some work. It goes very smooth over bumps. It's still a very smooth cruiser kind of car. It's just not even sporty, even in the slightest bit. You could never accuse this car of being any modicum of sporty. The steering still feels surprisingly tight. This car isn't vague like most modern cars with its steering. Uh, it's actually surprisingly tight. Biggest problem is the body roll associated with the car. This remains a great car to just throw your stuff in and do whatever you want. As it gets cheaper, I have been able to really appreciate that more. And now I don't care if it gets bumped into or scraped or scratched or whatever. I had a guy in a BMW back into me in a parallel parking spot here in Philly a couple weeks ago. And he got it and he was like, I'm so sorry. And I was like, I don't care. And he said, what, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I don't care. And I just drove off and he was like mouth open. That, that someone could not care. And that's one of the most, thi one of the things I like the most about this car is how freeing it is just not to care about that sort of thing. Uh, and that's one of the things, probably the thing that I will miss the most about this car compared to getting a new one. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that's my Range Rover. Now, Kelly Blue Book says my trade-in value is somewhere around three to $5,000 for this thing, but it's worth a lot more to me than that because of all the new parts thanks to the CarMax warranty. So when the warranty finally ends, I'm not gonna sell it. Instead, I'm going to give it to my fiance, the single worst gift ever. And now it's time for the Doug score. So here's how the Doug score works. There are 10 categories. Now, five of them are under the weekend group, which measures a car's appeal to enthusiasts. Basically, how much would you want to drive this car on the weekend? The other five are under the daily group, which measures the car's practicality and livability. Basically, how much would you want to drive the car every day? And again, there's a much more thorough explanation of all this stuff if you click the link below the video. Now on to the Range Rover's Doug score. And I'm going to take it a little slow this time and kind of go through all the categories since this is my first Doug score. Now we start with styling. The single most beautiful cars ever made will get a 10 in the styling category, while the ugliest cars ever made will get a 1. Everything else falls somewhere in between, and that includes the Range Rover. Now, an average car is 5. I think the Range Rover styling happens to be a little bit above average, but not much, so I give it a 6. Next up is acceleration, which is based on the car's 0 to 60 time. Anything that accelerates from 0 to 60 in 3 seconds or less gets a 10. Anything over 7.1 seconds gets a 1. The Range Rover does it in 8 point something, so it gets a one for acceleration. Next up is handling, which measures obviously how the car handles. The very most precise, tight, direct cars will get a 10, while the ones that steer you when you turn the wheel will get a one. Now the Range Rover handles a little bit below average, but its steering is still pretty tight. It feels relatively secure, so in this category, it gets a four. Next up is cool factor, which measures how much a car turns heads. And not just enthusiast heads at Cars and Coffee, but regular people heads as you drive down the street. The very coolest cars ever will get a 10, whereas cars that are seriously, dramatically uncool will get a one. The Range Rover falls right in the middle. It was really cool when it came out, but over time, as they've gotten cheaper, it has kind of made its way into the middle. However, it isn't uncool yet, so it gets a five. Next up is importance, which I guess you could also define as significance. Basically, how significant is this particular model of car, not necessarily the exact car I reviewed, but the model to the car world as a whole? Throwaway cars you don't care about, like that junk Kia I ran over, that would be a one. Whereas cars that are of the utmost incredible importance to the car world, incredibly significant, would get a 10. I like to think of this category as basically would you put this car in a museum? Now, my Range Rover is not especially significant, but it's more significant than your average run-of-the-mill everyday Nissan Rogue crossover, so it goes below average, but only a little. I give it a four. So the Range Rover's weekend score is 20 out of a possible 50. Since this is the first Doug score, I have no idea if that's good or bad. Now onto the daily categories, the ones that measure practicality and livability. 
Now the first daily category is features, basically how much stuff has the car got. Now the important thing to think about with features is I am measuring it based on the standards of today, not the standards of when the car came out. So that old Rolls Royce I did that had all those cool things that were really cool for 1996, that car wouldn't do very well by modern standards. And likewise, my Range Rover had a lot of high tech features when it came out in 06, but by modern standards, while it still has some stuff, it just lags behind most modern cars, even cheap ones. And so for features, my Range Rover gets a four. Next up is the luxury category, or as I like to think of it, the category that measures smoothness and comfort. Now, a car can score really well in the features category if it has a lot of stuff, but if it beats you up on the road, it's gonna get a pretty bad score in luxury. The cars that get tens in luxury are the Rolls Royces and the Bentleys at the top of the chart. And the cars that do poorly are like race cars and stuff that's just completely uncomfortable to spend any time in. My Range Rover has above average comfort, but it isn't on the level of Rolls and Bentleys. I give it a six. Next up is quality, which is the category that measures materials and reliability. The cars that do really well here are the ones that have really nice materials and great reliability or perceptions of reliability. The cars that do badly here will have bad materials and bad reliability, the worst possible combination. Now, my Range Rover has pretty nice materials. Even by today's standards, it's a pretty well-built car with nice stuff inside, but reliability, well, <laughs> So it gets a four in this category, below average. Next up is practicality, which obviously measures how practical the car is. Now, this is an objective category based on cubic feet of cargo volume. However, it also takes into account fuel economy and seating capacity. For example, my Range Rover's 74.9 cubic feet of cargo volume would normally give it a 10, but I can't ever seem to manage more than 13 miles per gallon in this thing, no matter what kind of driving I'm doing. So it bumps it down and it only gets a nine for practicality. And finally, there's value. Now, value takes into account how a car is priced based on the current market rate, not the original price, not the MSRP if it's selling for over MSRP. A car that gets a 10 in value is something that is surprisingly cheap but offers a lot of cool stuff, whereas a car that gets a low score in value is something that's radically overpriced to an absurd degree. Now, my Range Rover is a tough one to rate because even with all of its issues and problems, these things are selling for like six, seven, ten thousand dollars and that's a lot of car for that money. But it does have those issues and problems, and so that brings it right back down on the value scale to a nice square five. And so the Range Rover's daily score is 28 out of 50. Add that to the weekend score of 20, and the Range Rover's Doug score is 48 out of 100. I have no idea what that means. Is that good? Is that bad? Find out on my next review when I do another Doug score and I have something to compare this to. Looks a lot cleaner. This is a 